First, Patrick Moore presents The Sky at Night. Good evening. Do you remember Halley's Comet? It comes back every 76 years, and it was last with us in 1986. And although it didn't become a brilliant naked eye object, it did cause a tremendous amount of excitement. And this month, we have a very welcome and special guest to the sky at night, Dr. Donald Yeomans from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who's one of the leading experts on comets and has just written a splendid book on the subject. Donald, welcome to the sky at night. Thank you. First of all, will you say a bit about what comets actually are? Well, the heart of a comet is a ball of ice, mostly water ice, with embedded dust particles. And surrounding this ball of ice is a organic crust, a, a crust of carbon-based molecules, a whipped tar, if you will. And as this ball of ice gets closer and closer to the sun, it starts outgassing and throwing off enormous clouds of gas and dust. And the gas is blown back away from the sun in a gas tail by the action of solar wind particles. And the dust particles are also blown away, away from the sun, by the action of uh, pressure uh, of the sunlight. What are the dust particles actually like? Well, uh, some time ago, uh, a U-2 aircraft was flown in the high atmosphere and actually gathered a number of particles that were thought to be comet-like. Uh, in fact, probably from an ancient comet. And they're extremely small particles, uh, one or two microns in extent. Uh, this is an electron microscope image of one of these particles. And we've got something like 27 tons of this material raining down upon the Earth every single day. And I expect uh, we're all running around with comet dust in our hair even now. You know, I still get letters from people who say, I saw something crossing the sky last night. Can it have been a comet? And I always have to point out that if you see something moving, obviously, it can't be a comet. It's either got to be a shooting star or meteor, or cometary debris, or more likely an artificial satellite, but I still get that. But those comets are fascinating things. And what do you think is the most important point about cometary astronomy? Well, I think the, the essence of cometary research is, is a quest to study the chemical mixture from which the solar system formed. Four and a half billion years ago, when the solar system bodies formed from bits of gas and dust and ice, the leftover pieces, the debris, were the comets. And they remained in the deep freeze of space for so long that they still offer the best opportunity to study, to study the chemical mixture from which our planet and the other planets formed so long ago. Well, they certainly have a reputation all the way through history. There have been periodical panics um, because of the fear of collision with a comet. What do you think would happen if a, a major comet really did hit us fair and square? Well, you're right. The, the, the impact of a comet on the Earth would certainly be a disaster, a, a megaton disaster. Uh, even in the outer solar system, there's a, a number of evidences for cometary impacts. For example, Saturn's moon Mimas is covered with scars and craters that are the result of cometary impacts. And so the, the, the surface features of the outer planets and satellites are very much uh, dependent upon the ancient cometary impacts. Well, the Earth certainly can't be immune, and we have had one or two major strikes here. I mean, I think, of course, of the 19, 1908 uh, missile that hit Siberia. Yes, you're referring to the Tunguska yes, Blask of 1908. The thought there was that something like a 100-yard uh, meteorite or cometary uh, bit struck the Earth in uh, Soviet Siberia. Uh, Blue pine trees flat in all directions. Think of those things that look like matchsticks, they're really huge trees. Yes, and this, this photograph was taken 19 years later, so that you can imagine the destruction that took place at the time of the blast. It, it r spread out over a period or a, a distance of something like 20 miles. And but fortunately, we have two witnesses uh, who came to the fore to describe just what happened that day. We have uh, Ilya Petropovich Petrov, seen here, who described that uh, a herd of reindeer were destroyed. I think they were the only casualties of this particular blast. But another gentleman, uh, S.B. Semenov, uh, was located some 24 miles from the blast site itself, and yet he was knocked off his porch and his shirt set on fire. Just imagine the devastation that would have happened if that thing had actually hit a city. I mean, the death row would have been colossal. And luckily, it's not very likely to happen in the near future. Um, have, you been to, have, you, have you been out there? I haven't been to the Tunguska Blast site. It's, it's far too remote. 
Neither of I, unfortunately. But I have been to the Meteor Crater in Arizona, and that's a fascinating place. It is that. It's, it's right outside Flagstaff, Arizona, about uh, seven-tenths of a mile in diameter, about 200 yards deep. And it's thought to have been created some 25,000 years ago by the impact of a, a piece of a, an asteroid or possibly a comet. And the, the, the blast remains are still very evident. I remember years ago, we did a sky at night program for the bottom of the meteor crater. And at one stage, I was down there entirely on my own. I believe it was quite eerie. Well, that happened 25,000 years ago. But what about that theory that seems to be coming to the fore now, that something like 65 million years ago, there was a major comet or asteroid strike, which caused such an alteration in our climate that it actually wiped out the dinosaurs? That's a theory that's getting a lot more attention these days. The, the idea is that the, the dinosaurs were wiped out rather quickly from evidence of the Earth's stratigraphy. You can look at the sediment layers uh, over time and notice that the dinosaurs seem to have been destroyed rather quickly. And one way of doing that rather effectively would to have a, a 10 kilometer sized object strike the Earth, probably a comet or an asteroid, and the debris that was thrown up into the Earth's atmosphere would shut down the sunlight, the plants would die on the surface for lack of sunlight, and the animals that depended on the plants would also die, and, and hence the, uh, the dinosaurs. Do you believe it? I do. It, it's, it's beginning to be the, the theory of choice for that particular episode. Well, luckily, it's not likely to happen again, at least not in our time. But of course, comets have always been regarded as unlucky. Remember those lines in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, was it? When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. That's one aspect of comets that's been uh, obvious from the very beginning. The fear of comets in the Greek and the Mayan and the other cultures is very evident. And in particular, as you noted, the, the comets are thought to presage the deaths of noblemen and princes. Including uh, Julius Caesar. Including, including Julius Caesar. When Caesar was assassinated on the Roman Senate steps in March of 44 BC, a comet was seen shortly thereafter in the northern sky for about seven days and recorded in the contemporary histories. And it was thought by the common people at that time that this was the soul of Caesar rising up into the heavens. It was, this was the deification of Julius Caesar. And his adopted son, uh, Augustus, took advantage of this a number of years later when he became Caesar by minting a coin, uh, a Roman silver denarius, with his portrait on the front side and a stylized version of the Comet of 44 BC on the reverse with the inscription Divus Julius, Divine Julius. And this was his attempt to show that he was uh, related to the divine, now divine Julius Caesar. But the, the fear of comets certainly didn't end in Roman times. It went on in the medieval period, didn't it? It did. The medieval period was, of course, extremely church-oriented, and the church uh, took advantage of the natural fear of comets that had developed even earlier uh, to point out that when a comet appeared in the sky, this was almost certainly a sign from an angry god that these sinners had better repent or something worse was about to happen. <laughs> this is a, a medieval manuscript illustration showing a comet in the sky and the fire down at the left-hand side there is, is the result of this comet. Uh, this was often the case. Uh, comets were thought to presage disasters. Now, this feathery comet in, a, in another medieval manuscript also resulted in some disastrous results, as the smoke in the background indicates. It's a lovely picture. I suppose the most famous case of all is the, the Comet of 1066, which we now know to be Halley's Comet, and that's uh, shown in the famous Bayard Tapestry. Yes, Comet Halley came back and made a particularly close approach to the Earth in 1066. And, of course, it happened just before the invading armies of William the Conqueror overran the armies of Harold. And it was taken by William's troops to be a good sign and by Harold's troops to be a, a, a bad sign. But, of course, the tapestry itself was created by William's people, so... History is... Uh, a certain amount of prejudice there, I <laughs> yes, think. Yes, I think so, yeah. But after all, they couldn't tell it was a comet that came back regularly, and they had to wait for the time of Newton and Halley for that. Newton and Halley really formed the, the transition from superstition to scientific mm, study yes, of Halley. Newton provided the techniques. Here he is seen in his 64th year. Newton provided the techniques that allowed Halley to determine the paths of 24 well-observed comets. And in around 1695, Halley actually computed the paths of these 24 comets and noted that three of them 
uh, had very similar orbital paths and he correctly assumed that this was one and the same comet and it would return in 1758 and of course it did and it now bears his name. And again in 1835 and then again in 1910. Well I've met plenty of people who saw it in 1910. I didn't myself I hasten to add and it was very bright then and but it still caused a certain amount of alarm and despondency. It did. The fear of comets had not yet abated. Uh, in particular the, the tail of Comet Halley was predicted to sweep the earth on May 19th, 1910. And someone had pointed out that the tail of the comet contained cyanogen, mm. which it does. Uh, and cyanogen is a very poisonous gas. What they didn't hasten to point out was that the, the gas was so tenuous, so under-dense, that it couldn't possibly cause any problems. But this didn't stop a number of people from panicking. <laughs> and in this German postcard, we see uh, them poking fun of the sphere of Comet Halley in 1910 with the the woman jumping underneath the car. Well, the artist did it, uh, and of course the musicians. Indeed. We have uh, a number of pieces of music that were written in 1910 to honor Comet Halley's arrival. <laughs> Comet Halley Rag, I rather like this one. <laughs> you don't often hear this on the charts nowadays, do you? I don't think I'd heard it before two or two or three weeks. I'd heard of it, but I didn't actually know the music. It was good, I think. That was 1910. Yep. Then, of course, 1986. Well, we all know that Halley's Comet was not right in 1986 because the Earth and the Comet were in the wrong places at the wrong times. It was unfortunate. But, of course, uh, it was known when it would come, and the orbit is very well known these days. The orbit is well known because we have observational records of a comet going back to 240 B.C. The Chinese observed the comet in 240 B.C., the Babylonians observed it in 164 B.C., and the Chinese, again, observed it every return Thereafter, and of course the Europeans started observing it in the uh, Middle Ages and, and subsequently. And so we, indeed we have uh, an excellent knowledge of where the comet has been and where it was going to be in 1986 uh, for the arrival of the five international spacecraft that were designed to meet up with Comet Halley. We had two spacecraft from the Soviet Union, Vega 1 and Vega 2. We had two from the Japanese Space Agency, so-called Sakigaki and Suisei. We had the Giotto spacecraft from the European Space Agency, and we even had a, a leftover second-hand satellite from NASA called the International Cometary Observer that had, until just before Halley's arrival, been in orbit around the Earth doing other measurements. I think one of the most encouraging points about that whole affair was the fact that it was so completely international. I mean, the, the Russian probe sent back splendid pictures, the Vegas. The Russians were the first ones to get there uh, with their Vega 1 images. These have been image processed, and the interesting thing about their results was they showed, first of all, that the comet was much blacker than anyone had, had thought. Uh, it only reflects something like 2% of the light that's incident upon it. And even more surprisingly, uh, the nucleus was found to be hot, about 178 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you've got this hot surface of the comet, and yet you've got interior ices. It's sort of like a, a baked Alaska dessert with a meringue on top and a block of ice cream in the middle, and you pop it in the oven for a little while. And uh, the reason that the ice cream doesn't melt and the reason that the comet doesn't melt when it gets near the sun is because you've got this insulating layer on the surface. And, of course, the Giotto probe that actually went right through the comet and sent back close-range pictures of the nucleus did show those spurts coming out. I think it's an amazing picture, that. It is. This is a composite image of several illustrations, uh, several images from the Giotto spacecraft showing how black it is, the sun is off to the left, and when there's holes in this crust, this black tar-like crust, the, the subsurface ices are revealed to the sun, and so the, the ices vaporize and throw out the gas and dust that we see there. Well, it was a pity it wasn't a bright naked eye object this time, but um, photographs did show a major tail in spite of that. This is a, an image, a, a beautiful image of Comet Halley showing the blue ion tail taken by Gene Shoemaker. This, the image is blue because it is the fluorescing of singly ionized carbon monoxide molecules. And so we, we see it in this lovely blue color. Well, we haven't finished with Halley's Comet even now. And the most amazing thing happened last February. It's uh, very faint. It's now out beyond the orbit of Saturn, between Saturn and Uranus, and is still being followed with some of the world's largest telescopes, notably the Danish telescope at La Sierra in Chile, European Southern Observatory. And in February, Halley's Comet suddenly burst forth, and they had this picture, which shows a cloud of dust and gas round the hidden nucleus. And no one expected that at that distance from the sun. Well, can you explain it, Donald? What's happened to Halley's Comet? Well, the honest answer is I can't really explain it, and I'm not sure anyone else can either, but uh, that never stops us. So <laughs> let, me, let me try 
two explanations that have been put forward to date. Uh, the first is that it was s smacked by a rogue asteroid in this particular area and, and caused the comet to rupture and become larger. But Not very likely, I think. Not very likely, no, because first of all, there's very few asteroids in that area and, and the, the uh, issuance of material has gone on for several months now, so you'd have to have repeated mm. hits. I think a, a more likely explanation might be that this, this crust that we talked about that covers the nucleus is uh, it's been flexed because the, the nucleus is rotating hmm. and, and, and flexing at the same time. So there might have been a crack developing in the surface of the comet and revealing the volatile subsurface ices to the sun and perhaps a pocket of methane or a pocket of carbon monoxide, very volatile gases may have been uh, hmm. exposed to the sunlight and, and released. I wonder what it really is. It's a pity the comet's getting fainter all the time. Now it's getting further and further away, and it won't come back for, well, until the year 2061, which is a great pity. It shows that we don't know all about comets by a long way. What do you think is the main importance of comets so far as life on Earth's concerned? There's been an interesting uh, group of research put forward recently suggesting that comets are actually responsible for delivering to the early Earth the veneer of carbon-based molecules and water and, and other volatiles that were necessary for life to form. The early Earth's atmosphere probably didn't contain much in the way of water vapor, probably didn't, the Earth's surface didn't probably contain much in the way of these carbon-based molecules, but uh, comets are virtual warehouses for carbon-based molecules and water and, and methane and ammonia, all the ingredients that's necessary for life to form. And so the theory goes that uh, impacts on the Earth's surface uh, may well have delivered the building blocks of life itself. Well, clearly it is important to find out. What about future comet probes? One of the most interesting probes under study, in fact it's been uh, agreed, uh, approved by the U.S. Congress, is the so-called CRAFT mission to fly by an asteroid and then rendezvous with a comet. Now all the spacecraft that flew by Comet Halley flew by quickly, very quickly, and so they took in essence, snapshots of the nucleus. The craft mission seeks to take a, a movie, if you will, by staying with the comet for several years and studying its activity as it gets brighter and more active. And that's going to go um, off several <coughs> rendezvous of Earth and Venus first. It's going to launch in 1996, fly by Venus in 1997 to get a gravity assist. It'll fly by Venus once again to get another boost uh, and finally, it will fly by the Earth in 2000 to get a final kick that will allow it to travel rapidly out to rendezvous with Comet Temple 2 in 2003. Well, let's hope it works. And then um, in 2003, do come back and tell us about it. We'll be hoping to see you again on the sky at night before that. Donald, thank you very much. And um, before we go, don't forget the Sky at Night information line. If you want the latest news, ring up 0836 406075 or, of course, dial CFAX page 616. When Halley's Comet was here in 1986, well, some years before that, we had founded the Halley's Comet Society. And I'm wearing the tie now. Uh, the comet will be back in the year 2061. I don't think I will see it then, because I would then be 138 years old, but we hope the Halley's Comet Society will still be going, and although it doesn't do very much, it's great fun. And I was asked to write a theme tune for it, and I wrote the Halley's Comet in March. So um, instead of playing ourselves out with the Sibelius music, as we normally do, let's depart from the norm and listen to the band of the Royal Transport Corps playing us out with my own march, Halley's Comet. Good night. Yeah.